Welcome everyone. I'm Alicia Holland, an associate professor in the government department, and I'm thrilled to be your moderator for what we hope will be a set of conversations with current mayors about the challenges of governing Latin American cities. And I'm joined today by my two co-hosts, Steve Levitsky, the director of Dr. Class, and Fran Hagopian, a professor in the government department. Now, Hi, warm welcome. Can... Sorry? Just saying welcome. <laughs> Yes, you want to say hello, guys? Hello, welcome. <laughs> All right, before I introduce our speaker, just a bit of housekeeping for today's event. Um, first of all, simultaneous translation to Portuguese is available for today's talk. Just press the globe button at the bottom of the screen for Portuguese. Second, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation, but we have silenced your microphones. So you can submit questions in English, Spanish, or Portuguese through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to submit questions during the panel itself. The earlier you submit them, the more likely we are to have time to get to them. Second, we are recording today's webinar and it will be broadcast on the Dr. Class YouTube channel after the events. So it'll be both in English and a Portuguese version. And third, in the chat, you can find links to the Dr. Class online calendar, which has info on upcoming events. And finally, I want to give a huge thanks to both the Dr. Class staff, Paolo Ibarra and Jillian Scales, as well as Mayor Pai's staff, especially Carolina Tendler, for making this event possible today. So let me turn to the main event. We're absolutely delighted to have Mayor Eduardo Pais join us to talk about governing Rio de Janeiro. So Mayor Pais was first elected as the mayor of Rio from 2009 to 2012. He was then re-elected for a second term that ran from 2013 to 2016. And among other initiatives during that period, Mayor Pais helped Rio host the 2016 Summer Olympic Games. Now, after his two terms in office, he worked briefly as a consultant in the Urban Planning Department of the Inter-American Development Bank and as vice president at BYD Auto, a manufacturer of trucks and electric cars, but he couldn't stay away from politics. So in 2020, he was re-elected for a third term as mayor of Rio de Janeiro, taking office during the complexity of the COVID-19 pandemic. So three terms in office is a huge feat for a politician, so we're thrilled to have Mayor Pais reflect on his extensive experience governing Rio de Janeiro. When we asked the mayor to focus on two of the major challenges for Rio and Latin American cities more broadly, environmental sustainability and public security. These are obviously disparate issues, but we see them as united by common political challenges. Both issues require long-term planning, to make green investments or implement reforms to build more effective police, but voters aren't always patient or willing to pay for such long run improvements. So we hope to hear what Rio de Janeiro is doing with respect to climate and public security and to dig into some of the political difficulties of transforming Latin American cities for the 21st century. So thank you again for joining us, Mayor Pais, and I'll turn over the microphone to you. Great. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a great honor to be attending this panel here on governing the Latin American cities, which is always a challenge in the 21st century. Uh, and today, uh, my city, Rio, uh, the most beautiful city in the world, uh, being the subject of this, uh, of this conversation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, professors Alicia Holland, Stephen Levitsky and Francis Agopia, and all brilliant students uh, that are coming here for inviting me to be part of uh, such a distinguished event. So Rio will host uh, uh, Rio Plus 30 cities from October 17th to 19th this year. It will be a momentous event to portray us to the world as the bustling global metropolis that we are. And it will be the largest conference on sustainable urban development held by a, a city for cities. Rio Plus 30 cities will demonstrate what Rio and local governments all over the world are doing to really tackle the climate crisis. Uh, this year marks three decades of Rio 92. It's a milestone event that brought presidents and global leaders together to discuss sustainability. 
it was the beginning of a better world for us and our future generations. Uh, 10 years ago uh, at Rio Plus 20, uh, the urgency of action set the tone and moment for real change. I was mayor of Rio by then, as you said, and witnessed many hands of nations make bold climate commitments. Following up on this legacy, it is a great honor that I, again, as mayor of the most incredible city in the world, <laughs> have to do some propaganda here, if you, if you don't mind, have the joy of announcing here the Rio Plus 30 cities. All of us experience daily in Brazil, in Cambridge, and in the world, the effects of climate change on your cities and lives. Actions are urgent. It is us, mayors, who have to deal on the front line with extreme climate events. But we cannot solve anything by ourselves. We count on the intelligence produced by academia. We count on the collaboration of social movements. And we count on the economic sector, which brings innovative solutions to face our daily challenges. We live in a complex era, a period of time in which uncertainty, populism, and extremism are on the rise. Multilateralism is being challenged. Traditionally, cities did not take part in the global negotiation tables, reserved only for heads of state. This reality has been changing in recent years, and mayors have occupied these decision-making spaces. After all, cities are where the climate commitments are debated and implemented. Diplomacy is also, is also our business. Cities have done more and better, and I believe it is the time to take the next step. Real Plus 30 cities will push forward to more ambitious targets and actions. In three warehouses in the renovated port region, we will host a conference. These different hubs will have multiple multi-use plenaries, rooms for debate and places for bilater bilateral meetings. The Museum of Tomorrow and the Rio Museum of Art will be two iconic stages for conference activities. With an outdoor stage, we will celebrate the legacy and diversity with arts and music. It will be a space for interaction, interaction among all participants. Along the Olympic Boulevard, uh, renamed Green Boulevard for the event, we will become the public, we will welcome the public and promote cultural events and gastronomic experience. Thousands of people will be listening to our message in Rio. We will gather outstanding urban and climate specialists, hundreds of mayors, CEO, activities, activities, thinkers and scholars from the world's greatest universities, all together to convene a message of hope, action, and urgency. Local governments are the paramount actors for implementation of public policies for more sustainable and resilient development. Cities networks are also pivotal partners to mayors to leverage climate policies. After I had the honor of being elected and served as chair of the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, I have fostered unprecedented policies so C40 cities could match the scale of this crisis. During my three years as chair, C40, C40 has grown in size, influence, and profile. From 63 members in 2013, we have reached 90 cities from all regions of the globe. Today, under the leadership of Mayor Sadi Khan from London, C40 represents more than 700 million people fighting climate change. Real Plus 30 cities, city as is the result of alignment with the C40 and other cities that works to strengthen the urban climate agenda. C40 Mayor Summit will, will start right after Rio, Rio Plus 30 cities. So the attending leaders will head to Buenos Aires, inspired by the discussions and conclusions held in Rio. From the debates, an agreement will be made with commitments and demands from cities. Rio's declaration will showcase how mayors are standing together to face the toughest challenges of the 21st century and working to accelerate the transition to low carbon and equal world. Cities have shown leadership and need support to do more. Strong, concrete and immediate commitments require resources. That is how we are going to turn our plans into reality. Food is one of the biggest drivers for transformation, 
20% of global emissions come from food systems. What and how we eat, produce, and access health and sustainable food impact in our daily lives and environmental preservation. Therefore, at Rio Plus 30 Cities, we will host the eighth global forum of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Together with the 2025 signatory six cities of the Milan Pact, representing more than 400 million people, we will accelerate the adoption of policies for safe, health, and resilient food systems. We will celebrate policies that make a difference with the Milan Pact award doing Rio Plus 30 cities. We are here with uh, many brilliant students that understand the need for long lasting commitments and urgent action toward, toward fighting climate change. Leaders have to make decisions and implement public measures that will overcome the constraints of the administration calendars. Uh, for obvious, uh, when we talk about Latin American cities, uh, the, the, the brown agenda, sewage systems, uh, the situation of the, the poorest population, it will always be an issue as they are the ones that suffer most from climate change. It is our responsibility to minimize the discontinuity. At a time when politics has become full of hate, polarization, and disbelief for the basic facts, we need to reinforce the purpose of politics and politicians. Dialogues is the basis of politics and it's paramount to create lasting public policies. Uh, I'm passionate about the capability of cities, of local governments to deliver uh, environmental agendas. And it has been my work to fulfill this. And it's something that we will work a lot on, on, on Rio Plus Study. Obviously, uh, the showcase of Rio, the cases that we have success, environmental challenges, especially concerning climate change issues uh, in a city as Rio, uh, typical Latin American city, it will, all, it will always be uh, the greatest uh, charge, uh, challenge. Uh, Rio, uh, and as you probably know, Brazilian cities, they don't have the responsibility on, on uh, the direct responsibility on, on the safe uh, issues, on security issues. Uh, it's mainly uh, responsibility uh, by the state governments in Brazil, especially in Brazil. Uh, but the city obviously has a big role in uh, security issues, in safety issues, such as uh, the transformation of communities, the delivery of public services to these poor communities, especially when you look at education and health and culture. Uh, this is something that uh, we try to develop here. Rio has a history of urbanizing poor communities, the favelas of the city. Uh, we started that uh, in a partnership with the IDP almost 25 years ago with a program called Favela Bairro. It's called Favela Neighborhood. And we're still uh, uh, doing that in the city with 7 million people where 25% of its population uh, lives uh, in the favelas. Obviously, the poorest areas of the city are the ones that suffer most uh, with the problems uh, of security and safety. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, when we look at challenges concerning environmental issues, when you look at challenges concerning uh, safety uh, issues, it's always the poorest communities, the poorest people of, the, of our cities that suffer the most. Uh, we are uh, living in an economic crisis. In the case of Brazil, it's been lasting uh, since 2014, 2015, so it's a uh, crisis that it's, uh, it's much, much longer than what we could accept. Uh, when you look at the figures of Brazil, you look at the figures of a city like Rio, the, uh, the percentage of population that had gone into deep poverty, uh, it's, it's, it's a scary number, it's scary figures. Uh, this is happening uh, again for a long time now. And I would say that the, the social uh, part of the city, uh, and I see that in all Brazilian and Latin American cities, it has become a big challenge. Again, the role of mayors, uh, 
concerning uh, these uh, two uh, actions, concerning environment and safety, especially uh, preparing or protecting the poorest uh, part of the population. Uh, it is uh, an amazing challenge and it is, it is the main role. Uh, what the state level does, what the federal level uh, delivers, it doesn't uh, touch the reality of the population as uh, we do on the city, in the city level. So I think there's always uh, a challenge of financing these actions in both areas uh, from mayors uh, and especially Latin American cities mayors. So this would be my uh, initial remarks and it will be open uh, for discussion. Wonderful. Thanks for opening up the discussion um, and those initial comments. So let me start with two questions and then I'll turn it over to Fran Higopian and Steve Levitsky to also ask you some more as they filter in from the audience. Um, so my first question is, you know, many Latin American cities, Rio included, are criticized as not being particularly dense. So they've grown primarily through sprawl outside of city limits, often informal construction. And when we think about green cities, the push often is to create dense, well-served urban environments. So can you talk a little bit about how you think about densifying Rio and how you can change potentially the use of land to create a city that's better suited for um, continued growth? And then the second question, as you know, many times when we think about, you know, environmental sustainability, there's also a push to build new green infrastructure. Um, but building infrastructure right now in Brazil and across Latin America is, is complicated, especially in the wake of many of the corruption scandals and Lava Jato. Um, so we have a question in the chat that's also asking, you know, sort of what you've learned from the Olympic experience of building stadiums and large scale infrastructure to host the games. And what from that past experience could you translate into a push to build new green infrastructure today? So why don't we start with those two questions on density and infrastructure, um, and then we'll get another group in. Okay, so uh, let me start with the Olympics. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's obviously it's a once in a lifetime experience, unless you work in the International Olympic Committee. So I would always advise mayors, do it once, never twice, even if you come back as mayor. Uh, and I see that the Olympics uh, are, uh, on the contrary of the World Cup, are a great uh, opportunity uh, for you to uh, build new infrastructure in the city. Uh, I think uh, there is, uh, we have, a, a, I wouldn't say a, a image a problem with the Rio Olympics, uh, because it happens especially at the same time where the big uh, corruption scandals uh, came out uh, in Brazil uh, concerning everything. Actually, it was the moment that Brazil was most uh, seen. Actually, that, that was the moment that the country was supposed to be. Uh, I remember the, the cover of uh, The Economist magazine when Christ the Redeemer, right here in Rio, was you know launch, being launched like a rocket. And then uh, right after that period, uh, Christ the Redeemer was you know, in the mud uh, because of what happened in Brazil. As we can see from now, uh, things were not uh, as bad as uh, it showed for a while, as it seemed for a while. Uh, we saw what Lava Jato meant to the country. Uh, we saw the scandals of some of the judiciary system trying to obviously helping uh, to put in jail some corrupt politicians. But at the same time, we saw the judicial system being used for politics. Uh, there's the famous case of this judge, the head of Lava Jato, that once uh, elected his candidate, Bolsonaro, he became his uh, minister of justice. And right after that, he tried to run uh, for president, still trying to run for president next election. So it is clear now by some of the things that came out that, it was, that, that was also used as a political thing in Brazil. Rio Olympics uh, was one of the cheapest Olympics in, in uh, the history of the games. Uh, we 
most of the money came from the private sector, from PPPs and concessions. Actually, the, the Olympic Park in Rio uh, is uh, PPP. There, there's no, uh, we didn't construct any big stadiums for you to have an idea. The Olympic Stadium in London, one stadium, the Olympic Stadium in London alone costs, costs more uh, than all the stadiums of Rio Olympics. And some of the, the stadiums that were built in Rio, they were built as what we call nomad architecture. So they are being at this moment, unfortunately, I was not mayor after the Olympics, so I had to come back to solve some of the issues. They are being dismounted uh, and uh, they are going to be built somewhere else as uh, new schools. Uh, so these were some of the things uh, that could be done uh, for the city. Concerning legacy infrastructure of the city, uh, the city got 150 kilometers of BRT. Uh, it got almost uh, 16 kilometers of uh, subway. Uh, it got a light railway train system in downtown Rio with 26 kilometers. Uh, we have, as I said in the beginning here, we had the completely refurbishment, uh, renovation of the port area of the city. I was actually, I was, I was watching a, a Twitter post yesterday say that Boston is a great, great example. Boston uh, changed the viaduct that they had in their uh, coast area in 15 years. We all did that in four years, uh, which with, with a much bigger viaduct and it became a, a walking area, a big park in the Guanabara Bay region. So there was a lot of legacy to the city. Uh, but again, uh, the, Olympic, the Olympic city is a great opportunity for to bring infrastructure. When you look at these main legacies, transportation, when you look at the renovation of the central area of the city, which is the port area of the city, you come to the sub second subject. I mean, our planning for the city since uh, my past term was always to make the city more dense. As you said uh, before, uh, the, the history of Latin American cities, I mean, American cities are also like that, but the history of uh, Latin American cities is like you get the, the oldest part of the city, it gets worse, and then you develop a new area and you, and you make the city more expensive, uh, less dense, and with most of its problems coming uh, even strong, coming back even stronger. So uh, what we've been trying to do with all these infrastructure that were built uh, for the Olympic Games or inspired by the Olympic Games because uh, people at the Olympic Games didn't use the BRTs, didn't use the port area, it was not a, a, a a hub for the Olympic sport it was an area for the city. Uh, so these, these were, were all infrastructure constructed, inspired by the Olympics, but not for the Olympics. Uh, we created an environment where we could get the city back to the central area of the city. What we're doing in my third term, and what we're doing now is uh, we have, a, uh, we've been, there's been a lot of uh, uh, housing development in the central area of the city. In the past uh, year, we had almost 5,000 new uh, residential apartments uh, being launched by real estate developers in downtown area of Rio. We have a big project uh, which give great incentives uh, for construction companies to uh, renovate uh, buildings and transforming them from commercial uh, buildings to residential buildings. It's called uh, Project called Revivir Cent, which in Translation would be revival downtown, something like that. So uh, there's a clear option from my government uh, to get the city back where, uh, where the infrastructure is already built, where the city started. So we are uh, putting all of our efforts uh, to uh, incentivize uh, that people build in this uh, urban uh, uh, in this infrastructure, urban infrastructure areas, and not to sprawl the city or make it, uh, the territory even bigger. It's always a difficult task. You have uh, the will of the people, which is always, it's funny because you have to change the narrative. People are always trying to escape from the other problems of the old city and build a new world or a new neighborhood in a, in the last dense area of the city. And that's something that's 
uh, from a capitalist perspective, it's always been sold to people. Uh, I was reading a book the other day about the development of Copacabana, which is a neighborhood that everybody, uh, most almost everyone knows, uh, has heard about. And uh, Copacabana was sold by uh, the real estate market in the beginning of the 20th century as the new paradise where you could be by the sea and would be healthier, you would not have the problems of the old areas of Rio. So this is a, it's a narrative that we're trying uh, to change hard. And, and that happens uh, with policies, concrete policies that would be bring back, back people to the more uh, infrastructure areas of the city. Wonderful. Let me turn it over to Fran Hugopia now to ask a couple of questions. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Mayor Pais. It's, it's such an honor to have you here with us. I want to um, follow up on a few of the things that you mentioned in your talk. Um, so first of all, on security, um, you are in, and every Brazilian mayor is in the same difficult position of having public security be one of the most important issues to the people that you serve, but you don't really control um, the policing forces that this is in the hands of a governor. So I'm, I think we're all very curious, but you mentioned very quickly in your presentation about ways that you tried to compensate with what the instruments were under your control. Um, but I'd be interested if you could explore a little bit more what mechanisms you see that you as a mayor have to handle security, but also how you navigate the relationship with the governor um, about security. Um, how, I mean, like, you know, what, what is the role of Favela Bairro when you've got people being assassinated when you've got, I mean, you know, it's so like, how do you balance the things that are within the municipal jurisdiction and the things that are within state administration and even in some cases federal? Um, and so that I think would be a very interesting question to for you to expound on a little bit more. The second question that I have is a, um, is a, broader question. Um, I like to tell my students that um, a, an, a mayor of New York City many decades ago, his name was Fiorella La Guardia. You may know the name of the, the local airport. La Guardia famously said, there is not a Republican and a Democratic way of collecting trash. And I wonder if that is still true. How do you handle basic public services that People, people might have preferences about parties when they vote for president, but when it comes to having their trash collected or their streets be safe or their children being able to walk the streets, they probably don't care about this, but you have to live in this world. You have to negotiate with city councilors. You have to negotiate. How do you handle politics so successfully that you've been returned a third time to be mayor of such a marvelous city. Um, but how do you go about your daily job of trying to navigate building political support and at the same time delivering services that to your constituents are just something the city should provide? And I've got, if I can sneak in one last question, one of our graduate students, Jesse Bullock, who's done fine work on security in Rio, asked, thought of a question that I wish I had thought of. And that is, you hired a young secretary, a municipal secretary of education, but then I of Heinan Fejerinha, and we know Heinan very well here. Um, he was my student. What, what was your thought process in hiring such young people to lead such major departments of your city? How do you think about staffing your cabinet that you pick up a 26 year old Harvard graduate? <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, this guy, uh, well, first thing, the, the last answer is that I'm, I'm getting too old, so uh, I need some young people here. Uh, but just, uh, so uh, Fehrinho was a secretary of education uh, of a, a system of 600 and almost 650,000 kids. 
Uh, it's the biggest one uh, in Brazil and I think in Latin America with uh, 50, more than 1,500 schools. Uh, it's a huge system uh, and it, it is a big, big challenge. And he did a great job. He just left office because he's running uh, for Congress and by the Brazilian legislation, you need to be out of office uh, six months before the election. I hope he wins the election and comes back uh, to the to the sec to be secretary of education of the city of Rio. So uh, I'll start I'll start from the end concerning uh, the thing about uh, I, I I mean I'm, I'm in my third term. I think Brazilian uh, politics uh, is experience, uh, experiencing lots of changes. Uh, Brazil came from a point where uh, all the politicians were called uh, corrupt, bad guys, and the result of that was the worst possible. I mean, we got Bolsonaro. Uh, I don't know if I should be saying that here, but I am. So uh, what, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, there is no, and they call that when, when it happened in, in the 2018 elections, they call that the new politics were, you know, assuming the country, you know, getting getting in power. And I, I don't think there's this, uh, there's such a thing as new politics or old politics. There's the good politics and the bad politics, or the good politicians and the bad politicians. Uh, but it was clear to me, uh, having the chance of having a third term, and I, and I started politics real young, in spite of the fact that I'm, I don't come from a, a political family, nobody in my family has nothing to do with politics. I was created in a, a middle class, wealthy family in, in, in Rio. So I, I graduated as a lawyer. I was supposed to be a lawyer and make money, not be in politics. But I mean, uh, I had this call. So I started when I was 22 years old as a deputy mayor in the city of Rio. And I think having the chance of having this third term, uh, new ideas and new people uh, coming to run the city with me would help a lot, uh, third term politician. I mean, there was always this danger, you know, of being not being tired from a physical perspective, you know, but uh, losing kind of the capacity to innovate. So uh, the secretary of environment of the city has 26 or 25, something like that. The Secretary of Women has 23, 24, something like that. The Secretary of uh, Economic Development is around 30. The Secretary of Transportation is 31, something like that. So it's a pretty young team. As I said, I'm the only uh, guy taking care of the kindergarten now. That's why I used to joke with them. But, uh, but they're all very uh, uh, capable young people. And so there's this cap capacity of innovating and the city needs innovation, needs new ideas always, especially when you have the, the challenge of, of the economic crisis that Brazil is facing. So if you don't innovate in the solutions with the problems that the, face, that, that the city faces, it will always be uh, very difficult. So you have less budget, you have less money, and you have bigger problems. So uh, the capacity of innovation it is necessary. And there is a political responsibility for my part here. I mean, I think that uh, at, the, at this time of my life and of politics uh, and having this opportunity of having this third term, uh, it is important that you kind of give strength or support uh, young people that want to come to politics. So the case of Feirinha is one of these cases. Feirinha comes from a, a poor city in the surroundings of Rio. Uh, He's, he goes to this Olympic maths, wins a lot of Olympic maths, get this scholarship in, in Harvard and graduates there. And he comes back and runs for office and he, he wins the election. So, uh, so I think this is the kind of inspiration that my country needs. Obviously, I'm talking from a city perspective, but I hope I can I help contaminate, contaminate my country, say that this is the good new politics. There's good old politicians. I try to be one of them. And there's the good news politician. So that would be the main reason for such a, a young uh, team of uh, uh, partners here running the city. 
And, and this has to do again with your second question, you know, concerning uh, how you balance, you know, from uh, this everyday life of the city or the everyday delivery of the services that the city needs, which in a, in a, in a, in a city like Rio or any, any city, they're pretty basics. I mean, you need to have good schools, you need to have the, the streets clean, you need to have, uh, in the case of, of Brazil, we have a, a public health system which needs to work properly. Uh, you need to take care of the parks and recreation of the city, cultural aspects of the city. So uh, I, I, I agree with Mayor LaGuardia when uh, he said there's no Republican, there's no, there's no, no space for Republican or Democrats, or in the case of Brazil, for left-wing people or right-wing people. Uh, so from a, a mayor's perspective, perspective, you need to be much more pragmatic that's what I try to be. You know, obviously, there's always uh, the politics when you when you when you are in an office uh, such as the mayor of Rio, you are a, a, a national politician in the in your country, the second second largest city in Brazil. But uh, when you come to your everyday life, most of the, the decisions are going to be very very pragmatic. Uh, from a political perspective, in, uh, believe it or not, I mean, uh, being also pragmatic, and I think when you look at city council members, it's also a very pragmatic way to see the problems of the city. Uh, I mean, the demands, the needs from many neighborhoods of the city where city council members are elected, uh, they are not ideological demands. They are much more, you know, of good services. This is a thing that the, uh, the elites in our country, in our city, or the, the opinion makers, they have a hard time to understand how can someone be a city council member and not discuss, you know, from a left wing or right wing perspective, this or that problem. And I'll, I'll say that most of the city council members are pretty much pragmatic. If you are a good mayor and if you deliver good services, you get the support of most of these uh, city council members. So. I don't have I don't have a hard time dealing with city council. I mean, I, I was a city council member. My first election was for city council. I was congressman, so I mean, I try to be a a good a good CEO of this company called uh, City of Rio. But at the same time, uh, being being a good politician, I think that's very important. Uh, there is a, a, a th this time that ha happened a lot in Brazil. Uh, with all the problems that we face, uh, especially in, in the perception of the politicians, it came a period that people were saying, okay, we need good managers, we don't need politicians. And I think we need good politicians that can be good managers. So politics is very important. We are the ones that, you know, when we go out, ask for votes, we feel uh, the needs of the people much more than some bureaucrat that doesn't know anything about how life moves on. So uh, I think, I think I, I've been... I've been working that uh, properly, you know, to being a good politician and being a good manager and building a good team. Uh, and then your first question was concerning the security issues. I mean, I would take forever here uh, to explain the challenges and give some opinions that might be uh, kind of weird, but, uh, but let me try to make a point here. So what has been, so security is a big issue in Rio, as you all know. Uh, it's not the worst in Brazil. Rio, obviously, as the face of Brazil, everything that happens here uh, has obviously more coverage by the media and, uh, and, and people look at it more. But it's, it's a city with great uh, uh, security issues. And, and I think uh, this has become, uh, people have listened uh, less than they should for the uh, for the, the, the thoughts of Mayor LaGuardia. Uh, it, it's kind of, you know, of uh, there's too much ideology on a thing that should be uh, taken care of from a more pragmatic point of view. So the history of Rio, if you look from a political perspective, and I ran for governor in 2018, I lost the election to a judge that was supposed to be the honest guy that was impeached after two years for corruption uh that would say that he would put a hole in the middle of the face of the bad guys of the city something that i you know with my uh 
formation I would never be able to say. So people would, you know, the marketing people would say, come on, why don't you say the same? People are looking, you know, that we kill all the, the bad guys. Uh, so there's this, sometimes that's what wins, wins the election real. That's how I lost the election in 2018 when I tried running for governor. And there are sometimes people that think that uh, the reason for the problems of security that we face in Rio, on the contrary, they are only uh, because of the poverty, of the inequality, of the lack of services for poor communities in Rio, which I think it's kind of a prejudiced vision because it's almost saying, okay, all the poor people are violent and that's not true. All the poor people are thieves and that's not true. You know, every, uh, the absolute majority of the people are hardworking people. So, uh, so th that's why I say it's kind of an ideological thing. So the guys from the far right, they say, I'm gonna shoot in your head. And the guys from the left, they say, okay, let's solve the social inequality and the city will be safe. I think we have a solution in the middle there. Uh, I mean, obviously a police force and the challenges of police force and a less corrupt police force, uh, it's more than necessary. And that brings the problem that comes the parallel commands in Rio, which is, uh, or the guy is connected to, uh, to, to drug trafficking or what we call the militias here today. And, and this is kind of crazy because uh, these people are getting together so the guys from the militias that used to make their money on different crimes, now they're making also money with drugs. So this is, this is lack of state, lack of security from, it's lack of state from a, a security perspective. I'm not saying it's not, not lack of services. And obviously when you are in a country with such an inequality, with so much poverty, with such lack of basic needs uh, or, or attendance of basic needs by the people, it is an environment uh, or, or lack of hope. It is an environment uh, that it's easier to get more violence. So I, I think from one side, you need to have a, a stronger police force, a more clear uh, public policy on security, which is something I think we don't, we don't have. And at the same time, so I'm talking about police here, stronger police doing the right things, arresting the bad guys, not killing them, putting them in prison, in jail. And at the same time, you need to uh, develop or make life better to the people and give more opportunity to the people. So what I try to do as a mayor, and that's the role I can play, it's uh, improve that side of, of, the, of, the, of the problem, you know? So I can do urbanization of favelas, I can put more better public schools, as we try to do with Feirinha. I can build better health services. I can create more job opportunities. But the part of the police, which I think is the main problem, this is something that really, uh, it is a big thing. So it, it is something that we cannot, as mayors, act much. In, in you also, I'm trying to be brief here. This would take forever, but and just one last thing. And you also asked about the relation and how do I how do we push the governors to get things done? I mean, we try to support uh, as so as mayor for eight years. I'm going to be for another four if I want re-election, maybe twelve years. Also, almost a dictator in real. Uh, but uh, what I mean, I had different kind of governors. Uh, there was a moment uh, before the Olympic Games in this moment that Brazil was, you know, seemed to be moving well. There was, uh, for the first time, a public policy called UPPs. Uh, it's kind of community policing that became kind of famous, that seemed to be uh, working well at this, for a certain period, but it, it all went uh, bad again, mainly for corruption issues. So, I mean, it is, uh, if, you, if you ask me, what is the big challenge from an urban perspective, and it's not a mayor challenge, you can help, but it's the governor's challenge. That's why I tried to be governed would be security issues and uh, right public policy for security. So, I mean, it's not an easy answer to give. Wonderful. Let me turn it over to Steve Levitsky for another group of questions. Thanks, Alicia. And thanks, Mayor Pais, again, for your, for your time. A um, couple of questions about your climate change initiative. Um, one, you led off 
making the important point that uh, this is not something that a, that a single mayor, a single city can combat on its own. And uh, it involves cooperation, not only across cities, but, but transnationally. But I wanted to ask a little bit about how uh, real voters, real citizens um, respond to climate change initiatives. Is that, is that on the agenda? Is that something people care about? You mentioned just a minute ago that uh, Rio is a place with uh, a lot of basic needs. Um, how, how high on the agenda uh, of voters are, are these climate change initiatives? Uh, the second question comes from uh, actually a composite of a couple of questions that were sent in, um, has to do with tourism and the, and the, the balance you have to strike between um, climate change policies and tourism. Rio obviously depends very heavily on, on tourism. Um, not an expert on this, but I, I would suspect that tourists leave a, a pretty heavy ecological footprint um, and that they probably don't love uh, policies that, you know, turn the lights off or, uh, uh, or, or lower the water pressure in the hotels. So how do you balance policies uh, aimed at, at, at basic policies, uh, uh, pro green policies with efforts to attract tourists, particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic? Uh, and another question asks um, how Rio is using digital technologies, particularly in an effort to, um, to sort of raise Rio's profile and attract tourists. I'll stop there, thanks. Okay, so, uh... Let me start with the tourism and environmental uh, things. I mean, so, uh, I mean, our city is uh, it's well known from its natural beauty. So, uh, differently from most of the cities, uh, nature here is an economic asset. So, people decide, people and companies decide to move or establish in Rio or not to move or not to establish in Rio because of environmental uh, things. So uh, it's a huge economic asset. It impacts a lot in, in the everyday life of the city. So it has a big connection with the tourist uh, uh, sector. Uh, so I, I don't think we face many, many problems with the tourism sector when we protect the environmental uh, aspect of our city. So we have the biggest urban forest of the world, uh, if you get Tijuca Forest and, and uh, almost 40%, uh, 35% uh, of the territory of the city, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, by, it's, it's on forests, the two major forests of the city. So uh, if you go, if you look at the main uh, uh, tourist uh, places in Rio, they are connected to nature. If you go to Christ the Redeemer, if you go to Sugarloaf, if you go to Ipanema Beach, uh, they are uh, uh, nature, uh, uh, nature tourism uh, point. So I, I don't see a big, a big fight or a big uh, problem when you talk about tourism and environment in Rio. And again, it's a big, uh, big economic asset for a city. Uh, you also asked how hard it is, uh, uh, how, how big it is, or how hard, it, how, how tough it is, uh, how important it is, uh, the ecological, the climate change agenda in the voter agenda. Uh, of the city of Rio. Uh, I mean, from a, if, if you if you talk as climate change, it doesn't matter. You know, if if you if you if you if you address, okay, I'm going to be elected mayor and I'm going to take care of uh, climate change. That would take uh, only a few votes. But when you translate that to the real life of the city, that is a big issue. I mean, uh, when you look at the history of Rio, obviously. This is getting worse, but Rio has a history of big rains, big mudslides, in, especially in the poorest areas of the city. And, you know, once in a while, uh, big accidents with a lot of people dying in these mudslides. So uh, this, when you translate that to real life, uh, if you talk only about climate change, uh, the carbon, this and that, the ozone, this and that, this will not work from a, a voter's agenda. But if you translate that to real life, uh, when you talk about uh, garbage, when you talk about sewage uh, collection, <clears throat> sorry, when you talk about heavy rains and resilience of the city, 
when you translate these messages, they are very, very important in the everyday life of the city. Uh, so it's always obviously a challenge to translate issues that are more kind of scientific or more sophisticated, but it's kind of easy when you translate, when you get the message clear, uh, I would say that the climate change agenda, it is a big thing for uh, Rio's voters. And I would answer your last question when you talk about digital, uh, because we, I think we have a great experience here uh, on what we call the operation center of the city. Uh, it has to do a lot of with climate change. Uh, the operation center of Rio was something we had a heavy, big, heavy rain uh, in 2010, I was in my beginning of my second year in office. So we had this <clears throat> huge rain. And I mean, the predictions were terrible. The forecasts were terrible. We could not get it. And the reaction of the city, the capability of the city for being resilient was a terrible thing. So uh, reoperation center has become, uh, I think, an example for many cities in the world uh, as a place where, you use, where we, we use lots of technology. Uh, to try to get the city ready for uh, this big environmental uh, or accidents that happen because of climate change. So it was inspired by that. It helps in the everyday life of the city, but it has become uh, something, you know, the digital world is, is the technology, it's, it has become a big, uh, uh, a big instrument of the city to, to, to work its everyday life. So uh, we're trying to push ahead on, on uh, community participation on decisions when we look at, uh, you know, using digital information. We try to use, we created here uh, uh, a data a group, a chief, a chief executive data, uh, chief data executive, sorry, uh, for the city, it's one of the few cities in Brazil that has uh, this, this office. So we try to use as much as we can uh, the digital uh, and technology to make life better in the city. Great, so let me just dig into a couple of the themes that have um, come up for, for perhaps the last round, we'll see how we're doing on time. Um, so the first is really following up um, on the question of nonpartisan service delivery. So, you know, Fran asked you about the LaGuardia quote. I think some people today would say, well, there is partisanship in service delivery when it comes to the use of public-private partnerships or PPPs that you brought up. And the question in PPP is often is about equity. So if you're thinking of a model where private sector is providing capital, but you know that capital needs to be repaid in some way, whether it's through user fees or you know eventually the government footing the bill. Um, so as you think about the role of PPPs and especially in a financially constrained environment post pandemic, you know how do you ensure equity in those contracts? And I would also push into the broader question of you know how do you manage those contracts given that we've seen a lot of them go sour through renegotiations, corruption, um, and you know, often really putting a pretty heavy cost on the public sector despite the impression that they're free on the private sector is just you know, seeking profit and providing these services. So is there partisanship in that, that model of service delivery? And then the second question, kind of picking up on these issues of innovation and technology is, you know, American tech companies love to joke that, you know, their role is to, you know, move fast and break things. And you see that all the time in cities, you know, uh, if you think of Uber and disrupting the taxi market or Airbnb and the pressures on affordability in cities and providing housing for tourism, or we have a question in the chat about cryptocurrency and the role of cryptocurrency and sort of, you know, financial regulation. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about how do you regulate these new technologies? What has been a success in terms of really harnessing one of these new platforms for the city? And where are the failures been of, you know, companies innovating, but in ways that have really produced harm for the city? So uh, I'll, go, I'll go first to the last one. Um, it's always a fight between Uber and, and mayors. Uh, 
uh, as you all know. Uh, Airbnb, uh, I, I kind of, I, I would say it's, it moves uh, smoother, uh, but Uber is, a, I think it's a big issue. And uh, we delivered something here that was kind of simple. Uh, and that was a decision that I made in 16 when Uber was coming hard in Rio. What we did was we built our own app uh, and we started a competition with Uber. So it was uh, like of, uh, we call Taxi Rio. It's for the taxi that, are, uh, uh, that have the concession, the permission to run in the city. Uh, and what we basically try to do, and there, there was a big an interesting article in Der Spiegel uh, just a month ago saying uh, how real is PD Uber, you know? So we try to compete them in the same way. Uh, actually, we are delivering, we just delivered a month ago, uh, the, the, the Uber Eats of Rio, it's called iFood. So uh, what we just delivered, we also, del because of the success of Taxi Rio, this app, we also deliver, paid by the city, uh, an app uh, for delivery of food. Uh, because what you see, we, what we do is it's it's a cost for the city. It is, but I mean, obviously, we don't have the ca marketing capability of Uber or Uber Eats or iFood, whatever. But it works properly. Lots of people jump in, and uh, you make it. Uh, I'll say that would be a very leftist position for my part. It's against the liberals one once, but. Uh, at the same time, the percentage that we charge uh, from the restaurants, it's like say, uh, iFoods in Rio is around 25, 30% of the price of the meal, we charge 2%. Uh, we pay three times to the delivery guy, the guy that rides in the bike, we pay three times that this iFood pays. And we spend, I would say, around 10 million reais a year, which is around $2 million. So, for the distribution of money that we give, uh, I think it's it's worth doing. So this would be if you if we want to standardize the actions of the mayor, that would be a very leftist position. I'm almost a communist from uh, Bolsonaro's perspective when I try to jump into the market and fight with Uber and iFood or Uber Eats, you know. Uh, so, but I'd say it's not a decision that I made moved by ideology was a pragmatic one. So again, people might put that in the box of the left, but I would say that was the right thing to do to try to, uh, uh, you know, to be more equal to the people, you know, to be uh, more fair to the people. And that goes to your first question uh, when, when you talk about the PPPs or the concessions. Uh, again, obviously there are problems. Uh, but the problems are not because they're private or public. The problems are because people steal or don't steal, because they're well regulated or not well regulated, because people are corrupt or not corrupt. I mean, uh, I'm doing now another, I, I think I'm becoming a communist in this term, but uh, I'm doing now, uh, uh, I just did the, the statization of the BRTs in the city of Rio. It was a concession that I did in my last term it was not working properly. The guys were being very bad, involved in lots of corruption. So I decided to bring it to the city again. And I built a public company to run the BRTs. I don't want to keep that way for too long. I want to make a new concession with more strict rules. But for the time being, I'm running as a public company. So uh, it's always, in my opinion, it's always a matter I think it's better run by a private a group, uh, well uh, ruled by uh, the state level, the government. Uh, but in the end of the day, it's always a matter who will do better what you, the service you need to deliver. It's I can tell you uh, in this year as uh, owner of a, a transportation BRT company, I'd say it's horrible to the experience of buying tires, and hiring drivers, and this is terrible to deal with. I think the private sector deals much better than we do, but the regulation was not good. So again, it's always gonna be a matter of how do you solve that problem better? In the other hand, I told you, uh, we did the Olympic Park. Come on, Rio doesn't need stadiums. 
We needed the Olympics because of the opportunity that it meant of the possibility of legacy and not just for the competition, that 15 days competition. So I didn't want to spend any money on building stadiums. So I did the Olympic Park. This PPP was I gave uh, the real estate sector uh, the right to construct in the area of the Olympic Park. That's how they paid for it. So that's a very liberal agenda thing. So that would, would be put in the box of the right wing people. You know, the renovation of the port, we did the same, it was the largest PPP in Brazil. We built a nine kilometers tunnel, we completely destroyed a big viaduct that was between the city and Guanabara Bay, which is the reason of the city, it's the river of the city called Rio de Janeiro. It's a January river. Uh, and we did that with a PPP. Again, no public money. What we did was the right uh, to build, to construct in this area of the city. That would be, again, a very right-wing agenda you can put in that box. So again, I, I'll go back. I think, obviously, you can always put the policies that you apply, uh, you, that, you, that you, uh, you do. You can always put in the right-wing box, the left-wing box, the center box, weighted box, up box, down box. But by the end of the day, we need to get the best decisions, you know? Uh, if you have a problem of budget, financing, infrastructure, and you have the private money, go ahead and do it. Sell them the right to construct and let them do the construction. If it's something that you can afford and you can be very radical against Uber or against iFoods, and you know, and make, uh, make, make the policy help uh, the owners of small businesses, such as restaurants or the guys from poor communities that deliver uh, these meals to the people, you can be very left-wing and don't spend too much money, you know? So again, I, I, I'll be always taking uh, pragmatic decisions uh, to try to solve the problems of the everyday life of the people. It doesn't matter for me if they are in the right side or in the wing side. That's why I always say I'm center, baby. I don't know, not to be called a liberal. Or, uh, a liberal in Brazil, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's right-wing, okay? Uh, so it's a different uh, uh, meaning than in what it is in America. So I'm not a liberal from a Brazilian sense and not a communist from a Brazilian sense, which is obviously the left wing. I stay in the center. As we live in a poor country with a lot of poor people, I think the state needs to deliver a lot. So our health system is public. Our school system is public. And besides of all, it's part of all the critics, the, the criticisms that it, it, it has, uh, it works properly. Uh, it's a lot of services, services. You know, I had the opportunity to live one year in DC uh, working for the IDB. And I, I saw how, how, how expensive it can be if you need a, uh, a private health service as you guys have in the state. So hopefully we have our SUS here, which is our uh, public uh, system of health. It's not the best in the world, but it helps when you have the money. Wonderful. Well, we'll try not to put you in a box, but um, let me ask you one last question to close. We're very mindful of the time. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to sneak in two questions because we touched on this issue of public procurement and contracting, and many people do see that as the heart of corruption. I would say, you know, Brazil and Latin American cities have plenty of money to provide services if they just wouldn't steal it. On the other hand, you look at a country like Brazil, it has tons of regulations to prevent corruption. You have audit, auditors that are, you know, checking the public accounts. You have public prosecutors, newly empowered post Gato. And oftentimes you'll hear from public officials, the problem is we don't want to sign a contract. We don't want to take decisions because we're going to get prosecuted. And so as you try and actually implement some of these visions, whether they're public or private, can you get public officials to actually take the decisions and sign contracts? And where do you think Rio right now is in the balance between trying to prevent corruption and allowing a mayor to build things and implement bold programs? Last okay. question. Okay. We've, right. we've joked, you know, you're a dictator of Rio. Uh, we certainly have the time horizons to do it, but you're also a politician. So, what are the three things or a couple of things you would do if you were a dictator and could wave your magic wand and forget about politics, but that just aren't possible, that you just can't do as a politician? And let's leave it there. 
I mean, I'll, I'll start from the last one. I would never be a dictator. And I think as a politician, we can do everything. I believe in democracy. I believe in free speech and people, uh, the right to vote. I think that's always the best way to deliver things. So I, I, I know that I can deliver uh, if I work hard uh, and if you negotiate right and, and the right way, if you discuss a lot with the people, you can deliver. Uh, there's nothing you cannot deliver on democracy. In dictatorship, there are lots of things that you cannot deliver. So I'll, I'll, I would never guess being a dictator. I would love to be mayor of Rio forever. I mean, I love my, my position. I think uh, all the politicians in the world, they envy me because I'm the mayor of Rio. We're gonna have, uh, I, you know, can, can you imagine a city where tomorrow I'm delivering the keys of the city to a uh, king that's called King Momo. So we start carnival tomorrow. It's kind of delayed this year. And then for five days, this guy is running the city and we throw this big party. So this is an amazing place to be mayor, but elected uh, in a democratic way and with the terms and leaving once, uh, leaving when you have to leave. So I wouldn't do anything as a dictator. Uh, and your first question is very interesting because, I mean, the, the, the public integrity agenda has become a big issue, uh, especially for uh, old politicians, that's me, you know, that we're running a city like Rio, uh, doing Olympics, doing Lava Jato, and, and, you know, all of us, they, we were all accused of a bunch of things. Uh, and I've survived, you know, it's crazy, but I survived in spite of all the dictatorship that has been in our country. So. Uh, obviously, it's much tougher. I mean, if, if you come to me today and, and imagine if we haven't done the Olympics and the International Olympic Committee would say, you, you, you can have the Olympics, you deliver it. I would never do it again. Never. It's not because, you know, I have anything against the Olympics, I think would be bad, but it needs to have, you need to have guts and courage to, you know, to build all those toys, to build all this and to sign all these papers. Because at the end of the day, you know that you're going to be prosecuted. You know that's going to happen. So I, I have a big issue now uh, with the transport system in Rio. I'm having big fights here. And it is tough to make decisions, you know, because you always think, you know, okay, what will, people, uh, what will people say tomorrow, you know, when you leave office? You know, that decision that you made in that moment was the right one. But what will people think of it? So it's it has become the issue of integrity has become much more than integrity itself, uh, and that's bad. I think that's bad. But we'll have to come, uh, you know, to a, a point of balance there. Uh, the 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 weight was on one side in Brazil was you know you can be a corrupt, you're going to be happy forever, you can make all the money in politics in the public sector. And suddenly, you know, you're all deep. So uh, I think, I believe that my country, which is a kind of young democracy, uh, I think we're getting better on that. Uh, so, but it's, it's a weird moment that we live in Brazil. We have lots of people to uh, be watching what we're doing and not too many people to be doing what we need to do. So uh, we need to have more people delivering than, uh, you know, looking at things, and, and it's crazy because if you look at Lava Jato, all these uh, scheme that we built in Brazil, you know, the constitutional scheme that we built in Brazil from, you know, the public, from, from the ones that were looking, they were there. I always say, oh, something bad happened in the Olympics. I said, come on, where were all the guys that we have task forces from all the departments of the federal, state, local level, and nobody saw it. You know, so why is the problem only with the politicians, you know? So this is a big discussion we could take forever here. So uh, what I try to do these days, uh, we built uh, a secretary of, of public integrity. So we try to create a corruption center, a code of integrity for public agents, uh, supplier integrity analysis. So there's all this compliance these days. You know, I don't receive anyone from the private sector these days. It's kind of crazy, but some sectors I don't receive. I just don't talk to them, which sometimes I think it's bad. I think I should be talking to them, but you know, by the end of the day, I don't want to. I don't want to hear someone saying that one day I had that meeting with some guy, and the guy does something bad, and then you're in trouble too. You know, you have you were with a meeting with him one day. So, I mean, I'm 
pay much more attention than what I did in my in my in my last terms. From a, you know, a, 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 how how do you manage these things? And obviously, uh, in public office, you have to be honest, look like you're honest, and pray to the Lord and give the incentives that people around you are honest to. So uh, that's what we what we've been trying to do. Fantastic. Well, I hope that you can wave your magic wand to have honesty surround you and implement all these wonderful uh, proposals. Um, thank you again for your generosity in joining us today. We've had you know, thank you to the audience for um, sending in questions and taking part. Um, it's been a joy to have you with us. And everyone, please join us again next week. We'll be talking about the Colombian presidential election. So switching themes. Um, but thank, let's give a warm thanks to, to Mayor Pai. Vote for, vote for Mayor Pai for president in Colombia. <laughs> All, All right, well, not writing this time, but you know, we'll talk about the choices that are out there, so. <laughs> Take care. All right, thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care.